Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets, the fourth lecture module, which is on portfolio optimization and the stochastic discount factor. So today what we're going to do is talk about um, optimality and equilibrium. Remember we've already discussed arbitrage in the course. Uh, now we're going to broaden out and talk about those other two key concepts in finance and indeed economics more generally, optimality and equilibrium. We're going to do this using the theory of risk aversion that we've developed in class already. And then building on that material, I'm going to introduce the concept of the stochastic discount factor, which is um, equally foundational in finance and in fact was at the heart of last year's Nobel Prize awarded to three uh, famous finance economists. So starting out with optimality and equilibrium, let's uh, consider a portfolio choice problem. We're going to use the theory of risk aversion and uh, expected utility maximization, but in the context of a portfolio choice problem. And we're also going to use the discrete state framework that I introduced in the first lecture of the course. So we're putting a lot of things together here. We have expected utility theory, concept of risk aversion, and we have the discrete state model and we have portfolio choice. So let's jump in. We're going to consider an example with two states of the world in the, in the next period. And there are two Arrow de Brewer securities. So markets are complete since we have two states and two Arrow de Brewer securities. The investor is going to buy W1 shares of the Arrow de Brewer security for state one and W2 shares of the Arrow de Brewer security for state two. Now, these uh, uh, number of shares here are written W1 and W2 for a reason, because the wealth that you end up with in state one is simply the number of shares of that Arrow de Brewer security that you buy, because each of them pays you a dollar in state one, so you're going to end up with W1 dollars in that state. And similarly, you're going to get W2 dollars in state two. Now remember our notation for the price of Arrow de Brewer securities, also known as state prices. These we write with little q, so q1 is the price of the first security, q2 is the price of the second. Now the investor is uh, going to take these prices as given, goes into the marketplace, sees the prices, and solves the problem of maximizing expected utility of wealth in the future. What is that? That's a probability weighted average of utilities in the two possible states, pi 1 times u of w1 plus pi 2 times u of w2. How how does the investor do this? Well, there's a budget constraint. The investor has wealth W0 uh, uh, in the first period before the uncertainty is realized, and the investor has to divide that wealth between the two sets of Arrow de Brewer securities. So um, W1 shares of the first security costs WQ1, W2 shares of the second security costs W2Q2. Now, um, Let's derive the first order conditions for this problem. The budget constraint can be rearranged to say that wealth in the second period is just whatever you start with minus what you invest in the other asset. This is the resources that you devote to buying the second asset divided by the price of the second asset. Okay, that's just a rearrangement of the budget constraint. Now we can substitute this into the objective function of the problem to write it like this, we're maximizing pi 1 times utility of wealth w1 plus pi 2 times utility of wealth w2, where we've substituted out w2. So now the problem is one with a single choice variable w1 and no constraint. w0 of course is a fixed number, q1 and q2 are fixed numbers, but the problem is to maximize this thing by choosing w1. So in order to solve this problem, we uh, differentiate with respect to w1 and uh, take the derivative and set that equal to zero, the usual optimization in economics, which I'm assuming you know how to do that. So what is the first order condition? Well, uh, the derivative of this first term with respect to w1 is pi1 times u prime of w1, that's marginal utility of wealth w1, 
And then to get this second term, we have the derivative of this. We have pi 2 times marginal utility of wealth w2, which is just this whole thing, which I've just written more compactly as w2, times the derivative of this term in the brackets with respect to w1. What's the derivative of that? That's minus q1 over q2. So putting it all together, this whole derivative has to equal 0. Now, if we rearrange this first order condition, we find that we can rewrite it like this. The ratio of marginal utilities across the two states on the left has to equal a ratio of ratios across the two states. So this is the ratio of state price to probability for, for state 1 divided by the ratio of state price to probability for state 2. And in uh, in the optimal solution, the ratio of marginal utilities u prime w1 over u prime w2 has to equal this ratio of ratios. So what is the interpretation of this? Well, the optimal plan is to economize on wealth in states that are expensive relative to their probability of occurring. In other words, if a, a, a security, an arrow de security, is very expensive to buy, and it, it's for an unlikely state, you're not going to buy so much of it, and you're going to end up with lower wealth in, in the corresponding state. So remember that U prime marginal utility of wealth is high when wealth is low, so uh, low wealth will, will, will occur in the states that have a high ratio Q1 divided by pi1. Now, as you economize on wealth, of course, uh, you make yourself hungrier and hungrier in that state. So you'll continue to do this until the marginal utility of wealth in these particular states is sufficiently high to justify the high price probability ratio. Well, that's optimality, but let's now discuss equilibrium. And in doing this, I'm going to follow a famous thought experiment proposed by Robert Lucas, the Nobel laureate from the University of Chicago. So Robert Lucas's thought experiment uh, works like this. Let's imagine that W1 and W2 are fixed by the state of the economy as a whole, for example, by technological constraints. So instead of thinking like the investor who takes the prices as given and chooses the optimal amount of wealth to have, let's flip it around and ask if wealth is fixed for the economy as a whole, uh, what, what must be true for the, the state prices? So an example here would be that state one is a recession with low real resources, and there's simply no way to alter the economy-wide investment plans to reduce W2 and increase W1 because real investment opportunities are fixed. So in that situation, um, investors are going to try to reallocate wealth between states, but they can't do it. Uh, what happens is that their desire to reallocate pushes up or down state prices until investors give up the effort, they become indifferent across states. So in a situation like that, the equilibrium state prices are still going to be characterized by the same equation we had before, but written in a different way. The ratio of state prices q1 divided by q2 equals the ratio of probabilities pi1 divided by pi2 times the ratio of marginal utilities u prime of w1 divided by u prime of w2. In equilibrium, then, state prices are determined by probabilities and by investors' marginal utilities in the states. Now, of course, in, there's a special case in which investors are risk neutral. And in that case, marginal utility U prime is constant. And then uh, equation one will imply that the ratio of state prices Q1 to Q2 has to equal the ratio of probabilities pi1 to pi2. If we go back one slide for a moment, you can see that if the marginal utilities are constant, this ratio cancels out, and we're just left with these terms here. So under risk neutrality, state prices have to be proportional to probabilities. And recall that when we were talking about um, a betting game, um, we, we, we talked about the, the numbers game. One can talk about tossing coins. Um, I assumed, in fact, that state prices equal probabilities. Um, and that would follow from, uh, from risk aversion, um, uh, sorry, from, from risk neutrality. Now, 
if we had risk neutral investors and these state prices weren't equal to the ratio of probabilities, then what would happen is that um, investors would simply keep uh, keep buying the the unduly cheap Aradibra security, and they'd do this without limit. There wouldn't be anything to choke off their demand, and so you couldn't have an equilibrium uh, with those prices. All right, so this is the result for risk neutrality, which we were implicitly assuming earlier uh, when we when we did those examples with coin tosses um, and the numbers game. But in general, with risk averse investors, we have this uh, this different condition. And I'm going to summarize that in plain English as saying that payments to be received in probable and unpleasant states, in other words, states with high marginal utility of wealth, such payments are expensive. Okay, now that was Lucas's thought experiment. In practice, of course, investment opportunities are not completely fixed. Um, so to some degree, investors can reallocate wealth between states by changing their real investment plans. And then these allocations, W1 and W2, and the prices Q1 and Q2 are jointly determined. But still, the equation I just showed you, this equation, still has to hold when the dust settles, because the first order condition always must hold for any prices Q1 and Q2, including the equilibrium prices. And so this way of thinking about the determination of state prices does apply more generally. Now, of course, in the real world, we're interested not in these theoretical arrow de Brewer state prices, we're interested in asset prices. But once we have the state prices, um, we can use the basic relation between the price of any other asset and the state prices, which I already showed you. You know, the price of an arbitrary asset, N, is its number of uh, dollars it pays in state 1 times Q1 plus the number of dollars it pays in state 2 times Q2. So all the same insights apply for the general set of assets. Assets that pay off in unpleasant states of the world are expensive because they provide insurance, so they have a low expected return. Assets that pay off in good states of the world, on the other hand, are less valuable and they must offer a high expected return. Note that uh, a high price, given the payoffs, always corresponds to a low expected return going forward. All right, now in the last part of this module, I briefly want to introduce the concept of the stochastic discount factor. And you'll be glad to know we've already done all the algebra we need. We just rearrange the equations and reinterpret them. So the stochastic discount factor, or SDF, starts from the price decomposition equation that I had a couple of slides ago and called equation 2. Let's look back at that for one moment. Here it is. We're going to start from this. And I'm simply going to multiply and divide by probabilities. So in equation two, we had q1xn1. I'm going to multiply by pi1 and divide by pi1. And similarly here for state two, I'm going to multiply by pi2 and divide by pi2. Now I'm going to call this ratio of state price to probability. I'm going to call that, I'm going to write that capital M this is capital M1, this is capital M2, and I'm going to call this the stochastic discount factor that is realized for state 2 and for state 1. Now notice that what we have here is a probability weighted average of the product of two things. There's this M, the stochastic discount factor, and the payoff. And we're probability weighting that across the two states. Or, in other words, we're taking an expectation. We can write the price as the expectation of the product of M, the stochastic discount factor, and the payoff on the asset across states. So this notion of stochastic discount factor is nothing other than the ratio of state price to probability uh, for each state. Right in each in state little s, we write it M s, and then when we consider the, 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 consider this thing as a random variable thinking across all states we just write it as m and so the price equals the expectation of m times xn so to put it in words the stochastic discount factor is a random variable that differs across states but is the same for all assets what is this random variable it's the ratio of state price to probability 
So from the discussion earlier, it's going to be proportional to the marginal utility of wealth in each state. So we can say that the price of any asset is the average of its payoffs weighted by state probabilities and marginal utilities. If an asset pays off in states that occur with high probability, it will be more valuable, holding other things equal. And if it pays off in states where marginal utility is high, in other words, bad states, it will be more valuable, other things equal. Equivalently, we can say that the price of any asset is the expected product of the SDF and the payoff. And in recent years, this has become the dominant paradigm of academic finance. Um, you could look at the, the graduate textbook by John Cochrane called Asset Pricing from 2005. Or I've written an article explaining uh, last year's Nobel Prize, which is coming out in the Scandinavian Journal of Economics. And I'll post that on the course website in case you're interested. And these, uh, this article explains uh, the centrality of the SDF approach uh, to modern academic finance. Thank you.